Hello and welcome to another episode of the Forever Cash Life Real Estate Podcast, where we talk about all things having to do with cash flow. In today's episode, we're going to talk about land, but in a different and a mass scale way of buying hundreds of acres, subdividing them, selling them with seller financing, and I'm super excited to dive into that. Welcome to the Forever Cash Life Real Estate Investing Podcast with your hosts, Jack and Michelle Bosch. Together, let's uncover the secrets to building true wealth through real estate and living a purpose-driven life. All right, so here we are, and I'm super excited to dive into land flipping in a different way than we do this. And I'm super excited to have our guest today, Doug Smith, sharing with us how he takes hundreds of acres and subsidize them. Hi, Doug, how are you doing? Great, how are you doing, Jack? Wonderful, wonderful. So just to give everyone a little bit of a background, Doug and I know each other for many years already, and he used to be one of those evil house, uh, house flippers, right? Not evil, but they're great guys. They just don't know that land is easier, right? So um, he used to be one of the house flippers, and then I think you took off a year or half a year. You went to Spain, right? Yes, and, I lived in Madrid for a year. Mm -hmm, right, and then you came back, and then things changed. So give us a little bit of the history, Doug. Like, give us a little bit about who you are, uh, how you got into land, what, how you got into real estate, what, like a little bit of your story. Okay, sounds good. And I'll try to be brief so that we can really get into the meat of the topic and start helping people and maybe provide some tips that they can use to flip more land, right? So right. I'm, I'm from Lubbock, Texas, West Texas, grew up on a cotton farm, got a college degree, uh, became a computer programmer for ExxonMobil in Houston, uh, hated that, quit, started flipping houses, realized you can make good money flipping houses, but it's a huge pain in the butt, right? <laughs> uh, there's so many moving pieces and it's really hard to scale. So around that time, I started MyHouseDeals.com, which provides a listing of investment properties. And so I spent several years focusing on that. I still had rentals from all my flipping. I kept some, right? And then uh, that went bust and then boom again in the 28, 2008 recession. I built it back up again. It was doing great. I uh, partnered with somebody. They became the president of that company. I moved to Spain for a year, lived in Chile too as well. And... Um, I, and somewhere in there, I took off 2011 as well and played disc golf that year. Every now and then, I tend to do that. So uh, anyways, at, while I was in Spain, um, or before I left for Spain, I started flipping houses in Houston again. But this time, I was buying them for cash and selling them on owner financing. And that was going very well. You can do a lot better than the stock market with that. And it's a lot, it's a lot higher uh, rate of return and it's more stable, right? You're just collecting on those notes every month. And then we experimented, me and my business partner at this point, we experimented with doing this with land, buying a bunch of land, uh, subdividing it and reselling the land on owner financing. And it took about a year and a half for that deal to go through from start to finish. But afterwards we ran all the numbers in Excel and realized the margins were enormous that we had just made a killing because we had sold all this land on owner financing. Then we had sold the notes and just when all the dust settled, it, it was a lot more profitable than land deals or than house deals. We did go by, back in and buy a few more houses, but that's only after Hurricane Harvey because we thought we could pick them up for cheap in the flood. That was so-so. But other than that, I've been a land guy ever since. So that was about four years ago when I completely switched from houses to land. I still collect on some house notes, some rentals, but it's land. And uh, it's, a, it's a great game to be in. And it's a shame I just now stumbled upon it. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, we know each other for years before that, but nobody would ever believe me, right? So. Yep. Uh, so great. So, um, so why land? Well, the margins, um, there's a, there's a few reasons. Like when you get outside of town, you get away from a lot of these smarter, more sophisticated investors, right? I mean, these are, these are bloody red waters here in Houston, like mid-sized or large city with people that are trying to, they're, they're smart people and they're trying to become financially independent just like you are. And they think the way to do it is houses. So you are just competing against with all these other home buyers. Um, so I wanted to get away from the competition. Now land as well is beneficial with what we're doing is because we're basically buying wholesale and we're selling retail. We're buying in bulk and we're chopping it up and selling it for a lot more, right? Um, for the little slices. Um, also, what's working out for us is that the change of use when you take uh, something that was maybe for agricultural use and you're switching it over for, re for residential use well now it's valued completely differently and it's really it's valued at a lot more uh, what you can sell it for right um, selling on owner financing is great too because well most people don't know how to do it so or they're scared of it so we don't have as many other like competitors trying to sell on owner financing and then when you do that, you can oftentimes sell as well for maybe 10% more or so than you would if you just sold retail. 
and you're, you open up to a lot more potential buyers as well. So there's probably some other beneficial things too, but there's just the, the, the list of reasons to do land deals as opposed to house deals is very long. <laughs> right. Wonderful. I don't know. No, I've been preaching that for, for now, it's now 11 years or 12 years now. So um, that, is, that is fantastic. So let's dive into a couple of things that you just said. So what you guys do is, slight, is, is different than what we do. What? We are known as the land guys. We're known as, uh, as, as basically buying properties for 5 to 25 cents on a dollar or putting one on a contract, doing double closing assignments, transactional funding, whatever you need, or buying them outright, sell them, and not touch them, and just pass them on and make anyone for anywhere from 50 to 1,000% uh, returns on these deals. If we sell them with seller financing, the returns can even be higher than that. Right? Mm -hmm. I like to keep my notes because I love the cash flow. What you guys do is slightly different. So you guys go into, into somewhat outside of bigger cities, within what distance? About an hour? Uh, about an hour drive, sometimes an hour and a half, but that's really pushing it. If we can do 45 minutes, we will, but that gets more expensive. Right, so, so the one thing is like, the further you go out to the city, it's something I've been explaining forever, is obviously it makes sense. The more rural it gets, the cheaper the land gets. So you guys go out about an hour out, and then you buy, how much land? Uh, the smallest deal was 88 acres that we subdivided um, in, into 10 acre or 11 acre parcels. The largest was 852 acres. All so, right. So, so let's say you buy for the simplicity of it, you buy 100 acres or let's say 200 acres, 200 mm -hmm. acres. So you buy 200 acres and then what you do with them? Walk us through the process of what you do with those. Um, so we subdivide it, uh, we, we map it out, we sit down and think about how we can divide this out in, in a way that would be appealing to potential buyers. Um, and then we start uh, bringing in contractors to put in water wells, um, uh, gates, culverts, uh, driveways, home sites. Um, yeah, I don't know if I mentioned power. Um, so, and then we're starting to experiment with septic tanks, but very, very minimal improvements that are, that mostly pertain to infrastructure so that a potential buyer can go in and do whatever they would like with the property. And, and then we start, I don't know if you have any questions related to that, but then we start, um, we start marketing the properties. Um, right. on, on so let's, let's go into the, into the individual, just, just on a high, high, high level into some of the individual steps. So. You know, when you buy 200 acres an hour out, it's typically not zoned residential. So you talked about the opportunity of rezoning it to residential. Is that something you need to do out there? Or is these mini ranchettes, as you call them, are they also still owned? Are they still, um, so in some, some count, many counties that I operate in, land in those areas is just called vacant land. It's, it's like unzoned or zoned vacant agricultural. And it comes with a lot of rules that you can put in one residential property for every five acres, on, on the size of the lot, whatever the size of the lot is, but it needs to be a minimum of like five acres or so. You come into, you come into those situations that you do that or you do this? Well, we try to buy in the, in the surrounding counties where we're not gonna run any, into any sort of problems like that. But in the state of Texas, if, it's un, if you're subdividing into 10 acres or larger, you don't have to go through the platting process. All you have to do is just bring in a surveyor and that will cost you a good amount of money because it could be a lot of land, but that surveyor will basically, they'll, they'll chop up the land for you and that's about it. Um, when we're selling the land, we put in some restrictions for what the buyer can do. We don't want, want them to have a bunch of chickens out there like uh, chicken houses or like a feedlot or something. So we pass along some restrictions, but we're not, we're not being smart. confronted with a lot of restrictions ourselves, okay. which upsets so some good. neighbors, but um, and as a whole, but that's, that's good because that's, again, state by state. You do this mainly in Texas. Um, in, uh, in Arizona, the laws are somewhat different. That you have to go through a more detailed process uh, to get, uh, if you split it for more into more than five units, so into more than five properties, you got to go through a much more detailed process. So that's, that's interesting. So when somebody wants to do that, you want to make sure that you do it in the states where it is, where, where you check the regulations of, of behind subdiv subdivisions and sector regulations between not just, you're not creating technically a subdivision mm -hmm. because it's 10 acre plus lots, but you're creating mm -hmm. an assembly of 10 or 11 acre lots, right? Right, exactly. It's not, it's not technically a subdivision, so. Right, so, so technically what do, you, what do you do with, uh, with roads, for example? I mean, obviously a 200 acre parcel, an 800 acre parcel, 
doesn't have roads in it yet. Well, we try to buy land with a good amount of road frontage. That's why maybe uh, 95 to 99% of the potential properties that we're looking at don't work. It's because they don't have enough road frontage because okay. we want to be able to carve it out to where every little track that we're going to create, every ranchette has access to a road. So, okay, so you do sometimes that lot behind the lot concept for that, or you do mainly just if, because if you have one road, but it's like, um, like, I, I yeah, let me show you. that a little bit. Let me, well, you can I'm, draw I'm, it out. I'm holding this up, but basically it could look like that. Like maybe there's a road up here and there's a road way down here. And then we're going to have really long and skinny lots so that each one can have access to the road. Okay. That one makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So I, I know a lot of people are listening to audio, but there was, I, it was a horizontal road, right? Up right, top right. and a horizontal road down low. And they were carving out really thin uh, vertical lots. Right. Uh, that makes, that makes sense for, for that. Uh, okay. That's awesome. So now, what kind of utilities do you put in on those lots uh, before, uh, what kind of like improvements do you make to those lots uh, and how much do they cost typically? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. The, so for each ranchette, which is usually about 10 acres, we put in about $15,000 worth of improvements. So we'll put in um, water, a water well for each ranchette. So, okay. and that, that will cost about $6,000. It really depends on how deep they have to drill, but it's about 6,000. And we're always to working to get that down, like buy them in bulk and so forth. Uh, we bring in power, and that's only a few hundred dollars. And uh, there's right. someone, we've just got somebody that makes that call and coordinates that. And um, sometimes if we have to bring in power from like a little bit farther away, like one time we had to bring it from a half mile away, and that, that costs substantially more, thousands and thousands of dollars. But usually... Usually it's not that difficult. Uh, but then it, once, that's right, but you're spreading it also over, in this case, 20 yes. parcels. So we can so absorb it. So if you have to bring, pay, pay 20 grand to get the utilities in for half a mile or whatever it is, then from there on on, it's only a few hundred dollars for each, for each lot, right? Yes. Because you need, like, it's, a, it's, it's the cables and it's the power part, uh, the pole, uh, and, and, and the labor, right? Yes, you're exactly right. And we don't really mind spending the money to do that kind of stuff. We kind of like that. Like part of this business is the way we're doing it is kind of expensive. We kind of like that because it keeps other people out. <laughs> right. So it's a barrier to entry. So uh, sometimes yeah. things being a little bit more expensive or a little bit more troublesome are actually good for you. <laughs> right. No, absolutely. I mean, you, there's the, the, beauty of, uh, the beauty of the land flipping world is that nobody even thinks about it, which keeps most people out. But those who when you but those who actually start looking at it the way we do it, there's no barrier of entry. They can get in very quickly and very easily and uh, and do deals fairly quickly. But uh, we are protected in our market by just most people couldn't even conceive it. And and even though I've been shouting it from the rooftops, very very not that many people have actually gotten started in the land world because. I've been shouting it to you for years. I know. Sort of well, because and, it seems on the surface like it's just another category. Like it's there's multifamily, there's commercial, there's uh, mobile homes, there's a store, self storage. It just seems like another one of the ten or fifteen different like, categories, right? Like I guess no one ever slapped me upside the head and told me about the margins. Maybe you should have mentioned the margins. That's, <laughs> that's all right. I mean, I'm okay with the house flippers not coming over. I'm okay with the average person that has a runs a business is sick and tired of running 24 hours in their business or or runs an exhausting job and thing and just says like, hey, this is better to come over to us. It, I don't need all the house flippers come over. I we're attracting a lot of the, the frustrated house flippers that hit their head against the house flipping and started realizing this is too hard to come over to us. Uh, and, and a lot of people who just like, we have dentists, doctors, and, and all kinds of people, and, and engineers, and, 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 and bartenders, and from all walks of life, but yeah. they just want something, and they're open-minded to that. But now, yes. this is... Yeah, if, I but, could, if I could start over again, I would have gotten directly into what you're doing, what you're teaching, and then I would have either kept doing that on a larger, larger and larger scale, or I would have transitioned into doing what I'm not doing now, which is actually buying the land and improving it and selling it. But for sure, right. if, if I had known at that point, I would have gone directly into it. Right. So now, what is the average budget for a deal that you do? Like, what, what numbers are um, we talking about? And you don't have to go into breakout, but like... Like yeah, the average I, parcel an hour away from a big city costs what? A million, two million, well, half a million? Well, the most we've ever spent was 2.7 million. 
Okay. So usually there's several hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Um, so. And I think we've got another one at 1.7 million. So we, we bought 3,000 acres so far and we've sold half or more of those. The, the others are in the process of being sold. Usually, now how do you sell them? That's a good question. Uh, by the way, we usually buy for two to 6,000 per acre and we usually sell for uh, 12,000 to 17 or 18,000 per acre. Okay. It kind of depends on where, like the location and also the topography of that particular ranchette, right. different factors. Right. Um, so two to 6,000 and you put $1,500 per acre in place. So, uh -huh. and then you sell from 12 to a 16. Well, that's, yeah, these are healthy margins. These are They're good. pretty good. We margins. have a lot of uh, staff too, right? And you've mentioned this on one of your previous podcasts that these home flippers have a lot of overhead. Well, we've got a lot of this overhead too, because we've got a sales team. Right. Uh, we've got all this office staff. We've got a CFO uh, as an attorney. And then I've got an operations manager and I've got an executive assistant. Like that eats into some of the margins, but the margins are still there to cover all right. that and profits and this is a private equity fund like that's how i started structuring a year ago right so now i've got to pay all the investors as well but even like regardless of all that like there's still money to be made for me and my business partner right yeah so that is a great point so your strategy is not the strategy for somebody who runs an eight to five job and basically says, let me do some land on the side this uh, is no really your strategy, strategy is, yeah yeah this is a strategy for somebody who potentially is listening to this, has been doing what we're doing, or has been doing real estate at a high level already, or has been doing what we're doing and has been gotten up to a limit of, of what they can do and basically say like, you know what, that might be the next step for me. And that's how I wanted to bring you on because I loved your, your angle to it. I've been familiar with it. I have another friend in, in Houston that does the same thing. And, um, and he actually takes it to a level even further he actually gets cable and ray at cable television and, and, and other things in there and he has owns his own water company and then he basically um, goes and and, and rents that Mark, out Mark to Martin? people. Mark Martin? Yes, that's exactly what it's exactly well, he, right. we're an EO together, entrepreneurs organization. All right, right wonderful. I'm with him there too. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so, you were an EO, okay. Yes, yes, yes. So it's it's okay. funny, yeah, I know, I know Mark. <laughs> yeah. So um, so, so there's multiple ways that you can even skin that cat and then you can go about with that. But the bottom line is this is if for those who are ready to really take our business model and even take it a level higher and start instead of just flipping without touching, which is what we do, right? We have, I haven't even seen one of our properties in 13 years, right? So uh, we do everything right from here. But in your case, you are really you. You probably go out there a couple of times. My and, business partner does. I try not to. Okay, All right, makes sense. I mean, there's just dirt, right? But uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, at the beginning, probably you go out there once or so. But then, uh, but then Sometimes. again, for those who want to want to want to take this a level higher, this is a great this is a great model. So so um, I like it. So you, you said you do this as an investment fund, uh, private yeah. equity fund. So. Uh, talk to us about that a little bit. So basically, I was doing these deals with my money. It was basically the agreement was the situation was that um, it's going to be my money and my bank loans to buy all the houses initially with this business partner and then all the land. Well, I was doing that, right? So I would get 75% loans, right? And those, those were personally guaranteed by me, right, on my credit. And then so I was responsible for bringing the 25% down and then paying for the improvements, which were tens or hundreds, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, after doing that for a while and we had so many projects in play and that we had the money had not come back yet, I was running out of liquid capital, right? I was, I was getting dry on cash. And so I also at the same time, had, and I knew the profits were huge. It was just going to take a few months for some of that to pop. At the same time, I had a lot of people in my social circle wanting to invest in these deals with me. And so I went to an attorney to see how we should structure it so that they could participate as well. And the end result was, okay, the best way is the private equity fund. And uh, this is how they're going to get paid out. This is how you're going to get paid out. It costs 50 grand to create the fund. They're not cheap, but ultimately it laid the framework for what we have going on right now. And how, does it, how is your currently your capital stack structure? structure? Do you, like what, uh, if somebody puts in a hundred grand with you guys, what do they get? They get 15% per year on their money. So basically, and, and, the, and what, with, within which time do they get cash back out? They they start to get it right away in monthly payments, and then they are the the sunset on the fund is after three years, so they get all their money back. Okay, that's a pretty good return. 
It's really right. good, and I, I set it up that it's it's like so high that people are skeptical. But the reason, so a lot of private equity funds, they have a six to eight percent pref return, and then they'll do some sort of split on the back end, where maybe the the sponsor is getting twenty or thirty percent, and the investor is getting the rest, like a huge chunk. Well, ours is set up totally differently, so you're getting a huge pref return, but you don't get as much on the back end. It's very minimal. Right. You get you get like five or ten percent of the, each deal on the back end. But the idea is that you're just going to be really happy with your huge prep return. So I think it can scare some people because they think it's too good to be true. But once they understand it's not, then it's very good for uh, just word of mouth. Everybody tells their friends about it. And I would rather everybody just be talking about the fund and the good returns they, they're making and then brings more investors than me hiring someone to go out there and, and raise capital or me always having to be at every meeting and trying to shake money out of people, Right. Mm -hmm. No, I absolutely agree. I mean, we do also multifamily and our model is more of the model uh, that you just explained on the front of that love that the, with a the smaller pref and a bigger piece because the profitability of multifamily is not very high when you optimize the, mo optimize the property. But then when you optimize it, their profitability is higher on the back end when you sell it all out. In your case, it's kind of sim similar, but since you got things already going, you have a very profitable cash flow stream coming in that uh, now allows you to pay the 15% and then you don't have to give up much at the back end, which is totally fine. You can't. Right. Uh, yeah. It, it makes total sense. So, so we're able to do a, a lot more deals than otherwise we would have. Like I raised 5 million for the fund and, uh, somewhere between one and 1.3 of that was mine. I try, I'm the largest investor in the fund and I think that helped as well, but we're able to do a lot more deals than we otherwise would have. Uh, it would just, we would just be kind of sitting on our hands waiting for some of this money to come back. But when you go out and you raise several million, you can just go do more deals and make less per deal, right? Because I'm having to pay out all these investors, but when it all shakes out, it's, it's much better. Now, how do you look at the world right now? Are you, are you getting into shopping mode right now? Um, we're not saying that the values have dropped um, for land for sale yet, at least with what we're looking at. Maybe you're seeing it. No, okay. not yet. But typically it takes about six to nine months after an economic correction for the land, for that le level of land that we're talking about to actually also drop in value. So uh, it's a lagging indicator to the, we've gone to the, uh, to the back, to the downturn in 2009 and 10. We're able to tell that even both demand and supply are very high for uh, not supply, but the demand was very high for about six to nine months after the market crash in 2008, late 2008. And then sometime in 2000 and almost 10 prices started coming down. Interesting. And so we are, we are right now in this, this time around, because the impact was so hard and so quick, we're seeing opportunities to buy cheaper, quicker, while the prices are still very high. So our margins have actually gotten bigger right now, but, mm -hmm. um, but depending on how quickly this is being resolved, there will mm -hmm. potentially be some tremendous buying opportunities in six to 12 months, or even, uh, and some even more tremendous buying opportunities for some of your land, probably towards the end of the year, I would expect. Yeah, I was thinking that if we're gonna buy it for cheaper though, we're probably gonna end up and sell it for less as well, right? I mean, if demand is right, down. Right, unless you have the ability to buy enough that you can park it for a little bit, and then take your time with developing it because if you then come out of the development, let's say two years later, mm -hmm. then by that time, everything is going back up again. And now you bought cheap and you sold thing, which is basically what if you look at 2009, uh, the builders like uh, the buyer, uh, the builders like Toll Brothers and DR Horton and those kind of guys. I know Toll Brothers raised $1 billion from the investors in 2009 and went land buying in 2010, 11 when prices were rock bottom. They only buy, they're only building on that land in 2000. They only started building on much of that land in 2015, 16, 17, uh, mm. because prices had accelerated enough that they now can basically take advantage of the super low prices they bought at and sell at the super high prices they typically sell. Oh, that's nice. If I were to do that, though, I'd be paying out these investors and, and bank loans and all that all this time. And it, that might eat sure. up the profits. You know, if that you is. just have the money to sit in there and you want to park it, then yeah. That might require you to change the model for that if you see a big opportunity and go to a more split profit model, a land banking model. Uh, but uh, but I'm just sharing from experience. Yes, uh, it's good. 12 yeah. years ago. 
Uh, our deals normally last a year to a year and a half, by the way. So we, you know, we need to drag them out a little bit. You know what might be uh, something interesting about this recession, though, is that maybe we will see there will, there will be an increased demand for land, okay, just with people wanting yes. to get away from the virus, right? At right. the same time, a lot of these people have less money. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like what's going to win out like the fact that economically they're in an inferior position or the fact that they really want that land <laughs> however here's a great question and then uh and that is um that's a great question however what i found again in the 2008 9 10 recession is that the cheap properties the five the chunk stuff the five ten thousand dollar properties are like below ten thousand dollar properties particularly the below five thousand dollar properties which in our metal you pick up for 200 bucks those wouldn't sell anymore in after after 2008 and there for many for five six years they didn't sell right so what continued selling is the is the forty fifty thousand dollar plus things because mm. the people with money continued having money and the people without money didn't have any money and I just saw right now an article about who is most affected by the coronavirus and it's those making less than twenty five hundred dollars a month right they yeah, lost, you're right they can't work from home a lot of times right so they, they are they're in work and physical labor work, jobs that, that require their presence. And so, and, or, or they're in waiters and things like that. Entire Vegas, everyone, everyone there works probably under $2,500. They're all home. Now with that, the managers and supervisors are also home, but the top level of management is still managing those hotels and managing because the asset still has to be managed uh -huh. and, uh, and preparing for the, for the reopening and so on. So bottom line is, um, well, what we found is that the really interesting good properties continued selling really well because the people with money continued having money. And the first part of your, your comment is 100% true. It's already shown. There's been already a huge spike in interest in rural property just in the last month. So it's, uh, it's definitely mm -hmm. something that is, that is happening right now. I've seen it even with a couple of Facebook friends just longing for like rural land. I'm like, okay. It's good to know, right? I'm sure it's not just those two people in the world, right? That are no, looking. they're. I mean, people are sick and tired of being sick and tired in their places, and they want to just roam around and have bonfires and feel free again instead of just feeling uh, contained. So yeah, what yeah. about question for you? During the last recession, you said some of these lower end uh, properties, rural land, were not selling as well. What if you were to sell those on owner financing? Would that overcome the fact that there was less demand for them? For those below five thousand dollars, not even that. It they, they, even in an economic downturn, what what always happens is there's a shift towards seller financing. Mm -hmm. So you'll see a lot more of your properties also being selling for owner financing uh, coming up very soon. Because people do have money during those times, not everyone, but the 80% have money. They're just choosing to spend that money more carefully and not plunk it all down on a rent chat, but instead plunk down 20% and monthly payments. And once they feel economically safe again, they'll pay it off. So what happens is in 2009, 10, 11, we got lots and lots of seller financing deals happening. But then in 2012, 13, 14, they're all sold out. They all paid off. Because mm -hmm. they're like, okay, we got our jobs back. Everything looks good again. Okay, I don't want to carry that loan at 12%. Let me pay it off. Yeah. Right? So they paid it off very quickly, and uh, which is all good because it's more cash in the bank, right? So uh, I wasn't ever afraid of that. Uh, ever, never be And then sad you can redeploy it for sure. I, I do you like when they pay them off. Mm -hmm. All right, man. So um, love how this turned out. Love that we went from your technique into more like an, an exchange of experience in the land area and what happens in a recession. Um, so how can people find out more about you or if they want to invest with you or something like that? How can they find out more about you? Well, I send out a, a newsletter every few weeks. It's more of an update to all the investors in the fund. And I can include you on that email if you would like. Just, sure. shoot, just shoot me an email, Doug at HawthorneFunds.com. Okay. It's Doug at Hawthorne with an E, funds.com. Or go to HawthorneFunds.com just to check out what we're doing. There's a lot of pictures of properties and stuff like that. All right. So I'm not raising that, money. Yeah, go ahead. I will put that into the show notes. But you said you're not raising money? No, because I raised that $5 million and we're just deploying it. And so, um, but I will raise money again at some point. So if you want to actually like follow along to see what's going on so that right, when I yeah. am raising money, you'll be educated and be able that's, to make that's, it. That's perfect. Yes, <laughs> do that. That's great. And again, Doug is a great guy. No, we know him. I know him for many years and uh, love that you speak Spanish now too. And uh, That was so, a son of a gun to learn. I mean. I bet. Yeah, Especially as an adult. Like, but yeah. Have you spent much time over in Spain? 
I have spent half a year in Spain living there when I was in my early 20s. And um, and then I've spent quite a few vacations over there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I imagine from Germany, it's like probably a common spot to vacation, yes. right? Yeah. I lived there. Then I worked there. Then an internship there. And as a child, lived in Argentina too. So that's why. Wow. That's Spanish, awesome. So. And I'm married to a, to a lady from Honduras, Central America. And her mom lives with us. So she only speaks Spanish. So we have lots of Spanish going on in the house. Yeah. So are you always practicing? Or you feel like you're like... No, I speak probably a good half an hour to an hour of Spanish a day, but just around the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. I do that. I have rules with certain employees if they're Hispanic or speak Spanish that we only can speak in Spanish. So okay, that's you awesome. Have to, you have to stay on it. All right. So we had the cleaning ladies today. They only speak Spanish. So it's like, like, hey, come over, please come yeah. over here. Can you look at this? Can you look at that? That's all... It's all in Spanish. So, that's great. with that said, guys, thank you very much. Hey, you have you. We'll put the information about how to get in contact with Doug into the show notes. How to follow along with what he does. I love it. I love the 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 idea of going into that. Uh, last question: How did you come up with that model? Um, because my business partner said that he found a deal outside of town, some land, a lot selling for a lot cheaper than it should have been, maybe selling for. And he had the idea to maybe carve it up and sell it. We we sold those of uh, 30 or 40 acres at a time, and the margins were so good. And then eventually we realized we could go all the way down to 10. And the, the smaller parcels you have, usually the higher price per acre. You higher sell. price per acre, yeah. We started doing that. And, yeah, that, it was just started with that one experiment. All right. Very nice. That's all it sometimes takes. You stumble into your luck. You stumble, and if you keep your mind open and you have the ability and the knowledge and the preparation to try certain things, then all of a sudden this could become your next, uh, your next thing. Perhaps you have listened to this podcast for the very first time and uh, you uh, stumbled into this, never thought land flipping would be interesting. Contact us. You know where to get a hold of us, right? Landprofitgenerator.com. Um, go to our Facebook group, Land Profit Generator, la uh, la Real Estate Investing. And with that said, uh, thank you very much. That's a wrap. Thank you, Doug. All right. Thank you, Jack. Enjoyed this episode? Then make sure you like, subscribe, and post your comments and questions below the video. We're looking forward to hearing from you.